from that a little bit. Um, think about this kind of larger universe of agroforestry options um, and, and share what, what I've learned and what I've experienced regarding um, some of the opportunities for alternative crops relative to the uh, SAP and SERP operations that um, you're involved with. So just to kind of share some of those um, you know, possibilities and potentials. And you know, just to provide a quick outline before we get started, um, in earnest, agroforestry principles and practices, I am going to kind of delve into that a little bit so we have a sense of what, where I'm coming from, what I'm talking about relative to you know, a, a single form of production related to um, you know, tapping trees. Uh, and then talk about forest farming, which is one particular agroforestry practice, uh, and how kind of a sap and syrup operation you know, re can relate to or be integrated with or vice versa, forest floor crops and, and livestock. As, as an, another example outside of just the botanicals um, or our mushrooms as well. So, and then uh, kind of uh, push the boundary a little bit and uh, talk about some ideas with respect to silo pasture and riparian buffers in terms of SAP SERP operations. And then conclude by uh, sharing some programs and resources so you kind of understand maybe some of the efforts that are underway uh, to support uh, this form of land use and, and producers and stakeholders that are interested in kind of seeing it move forward. I like to start with a story, um, and I've been on faculty at Virginia Tech since 2007, and in uh, 2008, I was asked to go to the Shenandoah Valley Ag Research and Extension Center, which is in Rafine, Virginia, just off of I-81, so it's the Shenandoah Valley area, and it's one of these research extension centers that Virginia Tech owns and operates, and the focus is on uh, grass-finished beef. It's 900 acres of the property. Uh, and so 700 or so of those acres are pasture land where they're doing this kind of long-term research related to, you know, that, that form of production with respect to livestock. But they also have 200 acres of uh, degraded, primarily degraded Appalachian uh, hardwoods, um, oak hickory uh, forest type primarily. And so they wanted to get a forester involved. So they asked me to come and kind of think about, you know, from a whole farm perspective, yes, we have, you know, the livestock operation underway on the pasture land. But you know, back here when the proverbial back 40, although it'd be the back 200, I guess in this regard, um, you know, what can we do? And uh, so there's obviously some you know rehabilitation needed in terms of trying to improve the the state of the canopy and and the, the stems and you know so you know species composition, diversity, productivity, but also you know we we started to think more broadly about what can we also do underneath uh, that canopy. Um, so we we uh, implemented some treatments. And they hosted a field day as these uh, extension and research centers often do. And 150 or so livestock producers came to the forestry stop, which I was manning. So I was kind of at the, the tree line and they, the tractors were pulling along and you know, they're on the trailers and they get off and they all come and I've got my microphone. And so the, the first question I ask is, how many of you have a woodlot you know, on the property that you own or manage uh, for your livestock production? And 90 plus percent of the hands went up. Right, and so that is that kind of proverbial back 40 uh, that folks talk about. And uh, then I ask, well, how many of you consider yourselves to be an active manager of that woodlot? And there were less than 10 hands left up. And, and so it goes, we really have kind of divided ourselves along the lines of forests and, and fields are, you know, uh, boiling down to a single crop and focusing just on that. But that's where the agroforestry model differs because it is basically a, an approach to land use that seeks to kind of mimic a diversified ecosystem and create an agro ecosystem that can produce multiple products. And, you know, in, in terms of a technical definition, it's an intensive and holistic land management practice that optimizes the benefits from the biological interactions. So you gotta think about optimization because you're bringing, you know, different forms of production together in the same space and there's always competition for resources. And how do you optimize that? And that can be done over time, that can be done in terms of how you structure an agroforestry system. And then what do you get out of that when you, you know, intentionally combine those trees uh, with crops and or livestock in the same space? So um, it's a blended model. It's really about partitioning and managing, or in some cases, exploiting competition, right, for the benefit of the overall productivity of, of this system. Uh, and, and to do that, you have to optimize the temporal and spatial biological interactions. Right. So here you can see kind of a classic example from France 
This is durum wheat uh, grown in alleyways amongst poplar stems, right? So you have two crops growing, going on at once, two forms of production going on at once in the same place, right? So there is competition there and you have to think about how to optimize or, or control that and partition it, but then optimize the relationships between the component species. Right, and so I mentioned, yeah, you know, historically uh, we have kind of divided our forests and our fields, and that was evident in terms of the response from the, um, the livestock producers. But again, agroforestry seeks to kind of take the uh, principles and knowledge that we have regarding managing trees or managing canopy and push that out into the field uh, and vice versa, thinking about taking what we know about cropping systems and bringing that into the woodlands for appropriate species that are shade obligate that grow in those settings. So simply kind of put agroforestry as crops among trees or trees among crops. That's the way I like to think about it. But for this presentation, I'm going to focus primarily on crops among trees, uh, be it, you know, the ewes you see here in this honey locust silvo pasture at the Kentlin farm that Virginia Tech owns and, and operates, uh, or, um, you know, some golden seal and ginseng being grown in a forest farm setting underneath the canopy uh, outside of Princeton, West Virginia, right? So crops among trees. And again, just to emphasize, I know that it's earlier, but you know, I had a student say one time, you can always do something else when it comes to agroforestry, you're thinking about the other opportunities to layer in production, uh, not just singular, right? But it's a polyculture. And here's a good example of, of a farm. And this is also owned and operated by Virginia Tech. This is the Catawba Sustainability Center, which is in Catawba, Virginia, not far from Roanoke, uh, just off the Appalachian Trail. Uh, you know, kind of classic ridge and valley, you know, kind of a deep cut. You got mountains on either side. Uh, you have some bottom land. You got some hilly areas that are shallow to bedrock. You have some scrubby woodlands. And you got the Catawba Creek running through the property, which is uh, in the headwaters of the Chesapeake Bay. So this farm, uh, we've been working over the course of 10 years to diversify it using the kind of agroforestry framework as our model. And here you can see, it's kind of going back to the image I showed earlier with the distinct linear line. This is more curvilinear here, we see the tree line. Uh, and what we've done here is, you know, we've pushed out um, some of our knowledge, experience, understanding about how to manage trees into the farming space. So we have silvopasture, right, where we can run cattle and they can benefit from the shade of the trees. We have multifunctional riparian buffers where we're managing diverse composition of species along the creek side, many of which produce uh, food. Uh, of course, we have fiber opportunities as well there, but also protecting water quality. Um, and then fruit and nut tree contour plantings uh, up on these drier areas, trying to manage water as it moves across the landscape down into the bottom lands. Um, so taking that information, pushing out into the field, but then also coming back, right? So taking some of our knowledge about cropping systems. And you can see the top arrow there, that's an area where we're farming golden seal underneath the canopy, right? Then a little bit farther down, we have some ramps. We're growing ramps in that area. We'll also have some black walnut paths in, you know, doing some sap and syrup operations with that particular species and then mushroom production. So just to show, you know, all of that's kind of a blended model and, and give you kind of an aerial image there, but, you know, driving it home, it's not a single tree in a field. It's not livestock, you know, running amok um, in poorly managed woodlands. And it's definitely not, um, you know, ginseng hunting with, with shotguns. Uh, we're not talking about wild harvesting here. This is an intentional and intensive system that we're talking about. So it's something like this, where you have a nice stand of pine trees, you're managing a well, you know, distributed and healthy forage base. You've got livestock moving through that silver pasture, taking advantage of the shade, spreading out, grazing in more regular patterns, right? So you've got this dynamic agroecosystem underway. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and I showed you this image earlier too, like what's going on in Princeton with this particular forest farmer. Things are happening in the field. So we're planting trees in the field as I showed earlier. Also along creek sides, here we see a floral a shrub uh, with market value. Um, it's, it's providing also service in terms of water quality protection, but also a product. It's saleable in the woods, okay? Uh, this is also in West Virginia, um, and this is a fairy wand being harvested, okay, or, or cultivated um, underneath a canopy. And this is the De Jesus uh, system in Portugal. 
cork trees, you know, it's a dry, arid area. They're spread out. You've got cattle running underneath there and the grass is growing up, taking advantage of the available resources and what they can get on site there. And small farms like what we see here in Southern Germany where you have sheep integrated into a backyard orchard and so you can then distribute it and take advantage of the shade. Mushroom production, right? This is actually at the Catawba farm. So I, I showed you that earlier, the arrow kind of pointing in. This is uh, some of the work we're doing, but it's not just shiitake, it's also reishi. We have Nameko mushrooms growing. We have uh, lion's mane. Um, so a variety of different uh, species that we're cultivating. And this is in uh, Paraguay with the high grass and, and pine and a large operation here with cattle running through there. You can actually see someone's herding uh, on a horse. Um, and it's long been in rural areas. This is black walnut with uh, Durham wheat in France. Uh, and this is in Cameroon, a powder puff tree, the Caliandra, which is a, is a great pollinator. It's integrated with maize. It's also a nitrogen fixer, so it helps improve the soil uh, health and quality, and that benefits the maize production. Uh, and then there's a variety of other uh, benefits associated with that powder puff tree apiary being one. Uh, and we're also seeing it happen in the urban settings too. So it's not just rural, which has kind of long been the model, but we're, we're seeing this pressed into areas that are smaller in space, but using this polyculture model to really kind of enhance production. So in a classic sense, we have five practices that we look at, particularly in the temperate setting, uh, forest farming, alley cropping, silvo pasture, riparian buffers, and windbreaks. Windbreaks is a longstanding kind of classic example that goes all the way back to the Dust Bowl days here in the States, but to Scotland back in the you know, 14th century, in terms of using trees to you know, protect crops from wind damage and, and modify the microclimate. But as I noted too, also urban and community systems are coming online. But for this talk, I'm going to focus primarily on forest farming, because what are we talking about, right? We're talking about a sugar bush. We're talking about canopy. We're talking about stems, right? And so that kind of forested setting uh, is where we're taking the, the cropping information and experience and knowledge that we have and utilizing that to stack production systems in that forest and create that agro ecosystem that's vibrant and has, you know, multiple benefits. But I, like I said earlier, I'm also going to touch a little bit on, you know, some of the riparian buffer and silo pasture opportunities because there's been some interesting conversations that I've had with folks in terms of design related to tapping trees and how to manage a silo pasture. I do have some examples of folks actually doing this with fowl, uh, but, you know, ruminants, uh, that's also been an interesting conversation about you know, maybe the height of the lines and what happens underneath and then riparian buffers as well, just thinking about multifunctional species and some of the different species that are being tapped and, you know, or at least considered or are tappable, um, you know, that are well suited for kind of wet feet conditions, as we say, where those trees, they like the really kind of moist conditions right along the creek side. And then the urban and community systems with people thinking about, you know, food supply and access and, and food literacy in urban areas. So forest farming. Uh, and I'll, I like to start this way and say it's, uh, I'm not going to give you a ginseng talk uh, when it comes to forest farming. I mean, that's, that's really an iconic uh, species, of course, with uh, interesting and very valuable um, market in East Asia. Uh, so a lot of times when people talk about, oh, forest farming or non-timber forest products, I mean, the first thing they jump to is ginseng. And in some cases, in many ways, rightly so. Uh, but what, what I want to talk about you know, are what we may call off-roots in addition to ginseng and other types of non-timber forest products that are shade obligate species with long-standing markets. They might not be as elevated as ginseng, um, but there, there's been a lot of sales and transactions over decades uh, around a lot of these non-timber forest products. And many of them could be very suitable within a, a sugar bush. Uh, but also, you know, it's not just the botanicals or not just the fungi. It's also, you know, timber trees that are used for non-timber production, right? You do that as, as someone who manages a sugar bush. You, there's a timber tree there. Now, you, you may harvest it down the road, and there's some interesting properties with respect to the wood following, of course, a long-standing tapping and, and extraction. Uh, and some of that can go for high value. Uh, but, but really, you're using some high-value timber trees uh, for an alternative product outside of the, the timber realm. So I just want to open that up and say that's really kind of what we're discussing here is these, these other opportunities in addition to kind of um, what you're involved in. And, and here we can see this Mike Farrell, um, 
I've known him since grad school in, in New York, um, but he's talking about some sap syrup operations at in a uh, black walnut stain, right? Now we can see the tubing and, and the taps and all of that, uh, but there, look underneath, there's not really a lot happening there other than just the stem. So you see the trees, um, but there's uh, resources available on site that those trees aren't using. They could be directed toward other products that if, again, going back to the definition, uh, are managed in a way that optimizes those relationships and reduces competition. Uh, you know, you could stack in other forms of production while you're also tapping your black walnut. Okay, great, John, that sounds good. You know, why, why would we want to do uh, something outside of just say, take a stand, and some sugar bushes look like this, take a stand that looks like this, right? We can see primarily not much on the forest floor. That means we have a pretty good healthy canopy, uh, maybe some shrubs, maybe some ferns, other types of species will grow in those shaded environments, but there's not really a lot going on the forest floor that's intentional. So why would we ever start something that's intentional? Why, why want to stack in that? Well, many of our iconic woodland botanicals, um, this is perfect habitat for them. They require 70 to 80% shade. And so you're talking about a very healthy canopy, and you're also talking about great setting for those shade obligate species. And a lot of them grow on moist but not saturated soils, right? So you're not gonna find, say, some of the iconic species like sugar maple. Now red maple's different, of course, but sugar maple growing right down on the creek side, okay? And it might be growing, but it's not gonna be uh, of any size. It's gonna be useful when it comes to uh, producing sap and syrup. Um, but it does require, you know, mesic soils. Um, and in many cases, that's, uh, you know, related to aspect, but, you know, those broadleaf trees with respect to the woodland botanicals, um, you know, they're very important because of the cycling uh, with respect to calcium. I mean, that, that's, when you look at a lot of literature around, you know, um, high performing woodland botanicals, and I'm talking central Appalachia here, you know, some of the iconic ones, and it should be noted that 50% um, of the, um, woodland botanicals that sourced a global uh, nutraceutical or medicinal uh, market are native to Appalachia. And a lot of that is concentrated in central Appalachia. So there, there's a, I mean, this is, the, this is the kind of prime spot, the hotbed for a lot of the trade for, um, you know, woodland botanicals that have medicinal properties. And those that perform best, you also often see them in sites that have good calcium, high calcium. And so the broadleaf trees, maple being one, of course, uh, providing that nice shade, but then when they defoliate, uh, drop their leaves, and you have that decomposition happen, they're replenishing the soil in terms of the calcium, and that can be very beneficial for the plants. And of course, often these plants are often found on north and east facing slopes, right? And I think that's where we find a lot of our kind of mixed uh, species, you know, native hardwoods growing in those settings. Um, in the north and east facing slopes, particularly those that are suitable for, for tapping. And you have that good organic matter in that music soil. And they're also slow growing perennials. So it's not like, you know, you, you have to you plant them and you've got to go and harvest three times over the course of a growing season. You're talking about something that can be set out and the interference might not be all that significant uh, over time because you're just letting them grow while you're tending to maybe the annual operation of, of sap and syrup. Uh, but the rotations are shorter than timber. So that's one of the, the kind of ideas in terms of this blended model is, you know, you have um, these shorter rotations that can be kind of sandwiched between any potential um, silvicultural treatments or stand treatments that, that may be necessary to keep that healthy and productive canopy going. And they also have a lot, lot of, like I just mentioned earlier, longstanding markets. But one of the key things is, is that, and I'll get to this, there is a kind of a precious time right now in terms of the opportunities for value added through farming, all right? A lot of this has been wild harvested. And so you think about your sugar bush, that's kind of a, that's essentially a farming operation, right? Um, and, you know, integrating another crop into that system and letting it kind of take its course and tending it, you know, that, that's an intentional process. And that by definition is agroforestry. And that leads to a, a lot more credibility in terms of sustainability around that particular, you know, raw material that's coming out, that product is coming out. So you have some traceability, you have some sustainability. It's not just kind of coming out of the woods and who knows where it came from. 
but you know, there's the botanicals, uh, but we can also talk about mushrooms. Uh, you know, they need to keep 30% moisture in the log substrate. If we're doing long grown mushrooms, you know, you want that kind of deeply shaded area to keep that log moist and uh, the production viable uh, when it comes to the inoculation, the colonization of mycelium and the, the production that can occur. So, you know, it's not just the botanicals, we're also talking about fungi. And there's also edible shrubs like spice bush. You know, they're shade tolerant. They do well under hardwoods. Um, they, they can be a little bit of a nuisance if they, you know, uh, kind of take over. Uh, but indeed, you know, that you can eat the berries, you can eat the leaves, you can pulverize that. So there's, there's again, another um, opportunity for a non-timber forest product in those settings. So here's a nice example of uh, some ginseng. Uh, there's been some earthworks here with, uh, you know, kind of tilling a little bit, raising beds. Uh, among a, a hardwood stand, right? In that setting where you have 70 to 80% shade, you know, you've got the right kind of companion tree species you're looking at, so the conditions are good, mesic soils, uh, and you know, production is underway here, clearly. Uh, but outside of that, it's like, okay, well, you know, that, that stand might be being managed in an extensive way, which you know, over time, there's some harvesting that may occur. Um, and they're taking advantage of that green infrastructure and that canopy to, to produce that ginseng crop. But, you know, there's a little bit more activity when it comes to a sugar bush. Uh, and so I, like, I want to point out that there are examples of a diversified sap syrup operation, Steve Gabriel being one. And um, you know, he, he's in Trumansburg or just outside of Trumansburg, New York, and uh, has a sugar bush that's, that's actively managed. But if you look in the background, it's a little bit um, blurry but you can see he has some totem logs and he's growing some lion's mane underneath the canopy of the uh, sugar bush. And here you can see him kind of breaking open a bag of some sawdust spawn. It's um, been inoculated with mycelium and he's integrating that into the, the, the log totem logs, which I, I, if I recall correctly, are part of some timber stand improvement that's occurring within his sugar bush. So he's got some log substrate and he's growing mushrooms underneath while he's also, uh, of course, tapping his trees. And I'll note earlier, he runs uh, ducks uh, underneath his uh, uh, canopy as well. So he's a sugar bush with duck production and mushroom production on top of lion's mane like shiitake and so on. So a diversified sap syrup operation, there are examples of that happening and working. Now, this is an example of something maybe more um, kind of, I guess, systematic or linear uh, with some hybrid poplar trees that are planted in rows and then in the alleyways, and we call this an alley cropping system in agroforestry. This is out in Williams, Oregon at Herb Farm. Now they're growing uh, a botanical, uh, a woodland botanical, that's black cohosh. They're growing underneath the shade of these hybrid poplar trees on their farm. So uh, you can see an example here of botanicals being grown. So Steve has mushrooms and he has fowl, but here we see uh, botanicals grown in this alley cropping system. And this is back to the Catawba farm that I showed you earlier from a different angle. Uh, and what we have going on here, this is kind of where the arrow went into the, the black walnut taps. We're tapping black, black walnut in this area. We're learning, you know, and there's, there's been some ups and downs with it. Um, and I think there, there has been some involvement with the future generations there on site talking about, you know, what we're learning and, and maybe some kind of innovative ways to process the sap given some of the complications with the, the black walnut syrup. But, um, at any rate, the question becomes in here, you know, we've planted out and worked on reforesting this riparian buffer, um, you know, water quality protection being a big part of it, but uh, also integrating tree species that could be tapped. S sycamore is down there. And we do have a little red maple. Now, I know there's complications around red maple in terms of timing. Um, the sugar content's not as high as it is in, in hard maple. Uh, but then, you, you, you know, you also have sycamore. Now, there's some acidity issues there, too. So I understand a lot of that. But, you know, those are those are opportunities. And I think there are examples of folks that have been able to um, tap those sp uh, species in addition to hard maple, some of the more classic um, ones and, and, and have some success. All told, though, you know, when I we're talking about what to maybe integrate into uh, a sap syrup operation, you know, the, the broader universe of non-timber forest products is what we're talking about and what we're thinking about. And it's going to vary from site to site what, you know, might be suitable. There's, you know, 
climate issues, you know, what type of growing zone are you in and, and that type of thing. But, uh, you know, generally speaking, we boil it down to uh, medicines, things we can eat, uh, things that can be sold because we like to uh, decorate our tables with them or our doors or, you know, gift them. Uh, and then specialty products. So those are the four kind of classic non-timber forest products. Uh, of course, you know, sap syrup is a non-timber forest product. It's, uh, as I noted earlier, it's also timber trees that are being used um, in ways that provide non-timber products. So uh, that's on the edible side. And I think there's also medicinal properties as well, right? Um, that, that's also held up in terms of the sap syrup. And it's, it's not like this is a mystery or something that people aren't paying attention to. I just offer this as an example. I mean, there's many others I could go through, but uh, this was on the radio on July 22nd. Small scale farmers don't have to clear cut forests to grow these crops. And they're talking about ginseng and mushrooms. Of course, ginseng shows up as the icon, but um, you know, ramps is another example. Uh, there's a great one outside of Chicago, a farmer who is tapping uh, sugar bush growing ramps there as well, sells the ramps into the culinary markets in the metropolitan area, um, and then has more of a kind of lo locally distributed um, uh, syrup market. So when it comes to medicines, I mean, we're talking about nutraceuticals, holistic, you know, um, apothecary type products, ethnobotanical work. Um, so, you know, cedar oils, barks, uh, buds like cottonwood, leaves, roots, I mean, just a lot of things. And, you know, scores of products have been harvested out, out of our forest and, and sold or used for generations. Uh, roots, of course, that, that being kind of a, a primary one here in Appalachia. But they also are harvesting aerial parts of golden seal, which you see this image nested here uh, alongside the salt palmetto, which grows farther south primarily. Um, but those are some examples. But then, of course, the things we eat, mushrooms, nuts, honey, syrup, uh, fruit, leaves, roots, so on. We've all consumed these things. We, we know about them. Uh, floral and decoratives, you know, here's Galax in the nested image. A town in Virginia, and I believe a town in North Carolina named after Galax. Uh, and we can see uh, fairy wand leaf here as well. But tips, you know, from uh, your, your conifers, Greeneries, straws, cones, you know, pine straw, a lot of these things, the floral and decorative industry. So again, lots of stuff coming out of the woodlands. And then specialty crafts um, or specialty and craft products like cypress knees and, and bowls and spoons and so on. So that just gives you a broad idea, but I'm gonna kind of hone in now on, on what is, you know, primarily iconic to the region. Um, and that's, that's the herbs and the botanicals. And this is a little bit dated, uh, but in 2011, you know, the U.S. reached like $5.28 billion in sales um, around products that uh, uh, depend upon herbs and botanicals. And the raw materials coming out of the woodlands is around 500 million. Now that's grown because we have reports, you know, following 2011 that have shown that the herbal products industry just continues to grow. I think it's on 15 or 16 years straight now of growth. And uh, Quite frankly, COVID has, um, and I was just on a call the other day with some uh, herbal products folks, um, that has just exploded demand. Uh, Golden Seal being a good example because it has some respiratory properties and that is um, you know, four or five times the demand that they see, generally speaking. Uh, so there, there's a huge crunch right now. There's a huge need for some of the raw material on, on the part of the industry. Um, but what we know, uh, and from, from, from research at Virginia Tech, but you know, just in general, is that uh, most of it's sourced entirely through wild harvesting, which is not a farmed model. Uh, and I'm not, I don't want to cast stones at wild crafting. I think you know, foraging is a great tradition. Uh, and I think that you know, we wouldn't be, or the industry wouldn't be where it is today without uh, wild harvesters, of course. Um, but you know, when you're running up against this extent or intensive uh, increase in demand and growth in the market, and you're not able to really kind of track and trace and understand the sustainability over the long term or even in the immediate term of the supply for that industry, let alone what that means for the ecosystem. You know, there's some real questions to be asked about opportunities. Um, so what's missing for an ever growing NTFP dependent industry? Well, some of the traceability. So we can see black cohosh here kind of moving through a black box to some extent. And 
some of us have done some research to trace kind of how uh, the products move, but you know, there's still an element of mystery to it. And then it ends up on the shelf. Well, forest farming is different from that uh, because it's the intentional cultivation of these high value NTFPs. I mean, you're, you're forest farming, uh, you're, you're cultivating, you're managing non-timber forest products um, coming off of your, your sugar bush. But just thinking back to this kind of situation with respect to the herbal, uh, industry and and knowing that a, a lot of the areas we're talking about or working in are suitable habitat for the cultivation of some of these products, then we're talking about opportunities for stacking and layering in other forms of production that are extensive in some ways because they're long long growing, slower growing perennials. But setting out now means maybe opportunities in seven or eight years, six eight years, right? So. It's shorter than if you wanted to plant your pine trees and try and get a pine plantation going where you're looking at like 15 years maybe for your first thinning. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a compressed time issue there, but it is a, a method and a way to create that kind of demonstrable system that comes back to a property, that comes back to a person, that comes back to a place, that comes back to a community. And that can change the dynamic in terms of what the industry is facing regarding uh, the pressure and the increased demand. And there are three forms of forest farming uh, and they vary in intensity. Woods grown is the most intensive. Wild simulated is a little bit less intensive, but it still does involve some you know, direct application and, and some outlays and expenses up front to get things going. And then lastly, manage wild populations. Um, woods grown, as you can see here, I mentioned that's the most intensive. We're talking about raised beds, earthworks, monocropping, you can see here, that's a, on the left side, that's a farm in, in Maryland. They're, they're forest farming a ginseng and golden seal underneath the canopy in a woodland. And then on the right side, some raised bed work uh, for planting ramps. All right, so that gives you kind of a sense of woods grown. And that picture I showed you earlier from North Carolina is also woods grown. I mean, they went in there and mounded and you know, they're managing the ginseng along, along those ridges. Uh, wild simulated, uh, you know, that's getting some root starter stock or seed and, and pulling back the forest floor, the duff and ex, uh, digging in a little bit and dropping those seeds and root starters in there and letting things kind of work uh, their way in terms of the you know competitive ecosystem. You're not trying to push things out, but you're planting them in. So you have a polyculture going with other types of species that are already growing there, but it's a wild simulated model. And here we see a, kind of a good example again in West Virginia with some light terracing, uh, very, very light and some wild simulated uh, growth happening in there. Notice the fence in the back though, you know, you still have to invest in protection. And that's always a big question about theft. A lot of that has, you know, tied, is tied to ginseng because of its high market value. But if we start to see some of these other botanicals come up or other non-timber forest products come up in terms of their price points, there could also be, you know, some issues with respect to protecting those crops uh, too. Here's woods grown with, with shiitake mushrooms, right? So uh, this landowner has a, a rail that they've put in. They have a, a uh, sprinkler system uh, and they have uh, run lines out there. And they, of course, are doing the shocking technique to kind of flush the mushroom in a more timely fashion. But then you have this owner in Georgia who inoculated the logs and just kind of chucked them out there. And basically uh, his technique is throws them out there. And when you get the big rain, um, you know, you wait a couple of days and you sneak out in the middle of the night and you go uh, harvest your shiitake. Uh, it's a little bit more of a wild simulated approach or something like this, like rafts uh, buried uh, parsley and soil. Um, we can see here with some reishi and Namako production kind of in a wetter area next to an ephemeral stream. And then lastly, manage wild populations. So this is a stand of ramps that was not planted. Uh, but has been managed and, and has grown out there. So there's been some intentional kind of cultivation, tending of that to expand that uh, base of production. Right, so um, yeah, it's good. We, we can say there's markets and there are some reports on the American Herbal Products Association that uh, are kind of hard to come by if you're in the general public. If you're a member, they're easy to come by, but you know, in terms of making that information available, so we at least have a sense of the volume of what's happening. Um, you know, that, that's something that has not really existed, but Virginia Tech collaborated with the Forest Service to look at annual volume, trade location, average prices, and the primary buyers of these iconic Eastern 
forest herbal plants. So at least we can understand the scale of the market and the price points and that type of thing. And so what we did is we surveyed um, ginseng buyers uh, because they're registered. And we found that like almost half of them uh, purchase off roots, which are these other uh, botanicals. And uh, we, we not, just, just, didn't just ask them like, do you buy them? But like, where are you buying them? And at what volume in different areas? And at what price points? So that we could kind of create these heat maps. And you can see here as an example, the black cohosh, uh, which you know, is harvested by volume many times more than ginseng is. Um, the hot spots really being Southern West Virginia, Southwest Virginia, and what we're looking at kind of in Eastern Kentucky. Uh, so a lot of black cohosh moving out of these areas. Uh, we estimate about 264,000 dry pounds a year. Uh, and this research has been published in the peer reviewed. So now we have kind of more, and it's open source. We now have more of a, a base of understanding of the, of the volume, but also where it's coming from in the prices. But we did that for other species too. So it was 11 species we looked at. False unicorn, you can see a little bit more southerly in terms of the market activity. Golden seal, back into the pocket, central Appalachia, southern West Virginia, southwest Virginia, eastern Kentucky, and a little bit uh, what we're looking at up there in the Southeast Ohio, but you also see that happening in Southern Indiana, like over the Ohio River Valley and so on. But here, here's kind of the, the rub, actually. Um, if you, you know, great, there's 264,000 dry pounds of black cohosh moving out of the woods on an annual basis. But look at the mean dry price, $3.62. So if you wanted to, yeah, as a, you know, a producer, say, hey, let's invest in black cohosh underneath your sugar bush. And on the market, you can get $3.62 a pound if you let that crop grow for eight years and you invest in protection, you steward it, you're trying to keep the bowls off of it maybe a little bit, you know, so on and so forth. That just doesn't, you know, ink out when it comes to uh, an, a good investment. Um, and so that's really kind of the rub. The wild harvested model has allowed for these lower price points to kind of come into play because folks aren't investing on the front end and, and laying out expenses and so on to get that operation going or just going to find the plant and extracting it. Of course, there's implications in terms of you know, plant population sustainability as the market increases. Also too, there's maybe some justice issues here in terms of price points. I mean, to, you know, all that work to pull out 264,000 dried pounds, not easy work, uh, and it's less than a million that's being paid out. Now, if we look at golden seal, for instance, uh, 106,000 pounds, uh, what we estimate. All right, um, that doesn't sound like a lot when it comes to timber volume, but you know, if you just take this, and of course, this is back of the napkin, and we can debate the numbers, but some estimate like 400 plant, plants a pound. That's a lot of plants, millions of plants that have to get harvested. So there's a lot of activity underway to get that you know medicinal natural product into the supply chain, and the price points are a little bit better, 2238. But if you look at some of the research, that stills under what it takes to, to kind of scratch out a, a, a profitable operation. So what we did is we kind of made the case here, you know, with black cohosh. And uh, Katie, let me know. I'm just check the time here real quick. All right, we're doing good. Um, you know, let, let's just look at. So we had 264,000 pounds, um, so close to you know 300,000 or so, and with a wild payout of 362, you know, you're coming in under a million as an estimate, of course, that's being paid. Um, now, if we were to convert 5% to farmed and a very modest price increase, because there are examples of it going much higher for farm material at $25 a pound, um, you know, the increase is uh, on the order of like a quarter million dollars that's being paid out for the, as a farm material is added in. And then that can kind of back of the napkin activity can continue on where you see is this 20% farmed more than double what's being paid out. So uh, I think that when we talk about the idea of what's going on in the supply chain and that there's a bit of a black box and there's concern about the you know, pressure on the plant populations and sustainability and also adulteration to you know, wanting good quality product coming in to, to the market, um, you know, investments are something that the industry is gonna have to look at and that those things uh, are happening now. I'll talk a little bit more about whether it's fast or not, but at any rate, um, some of those things are underway. So the, all that's to say is boiled down to, you know, farming concepts and market hypotheticals are one thing. 
that's great, John. You showed me some bar graphs and they changed, but sales are another. So what's actually happening? Uh, well, the current situation is that there is a changing NTFP mark. Um, I'm, not, I'm not making that up. Uh, whether the change is dramatic or not, that can be de debated, but there is some change. And the focus is uh, increasingly so on traceability and the predictability of supply uh, with some teeth in terms of the revenue potentials and the payout uh, that will allow for um, traceability and chain of custody that, you know, build some legitimacy into a corporate social responsibility model or a sustainability accounting model that, you know, can service a discriminating base of consumers, which if you look at some of the kind of consumer research, we're seeing that folks are, particularly some of the younger generations, interested in that conscientious consumerism and paying a little bit more to know that they're being part of change, part of positive change. So forest farming provides an opportunity to add value to the NTFP supply chains. I mean, the, the SAP syrup uh, industry, I mean, that's so mature and it's, it's it, you know, I, I don't know all the struggles that you deal with um, and I'm sure there are many, but you know, the maturity of that market um, and, you know, some of the, the value add and the price points and so on, you know, it's a little bit different from what we're dealing with from some of the wild harvested stuff. Now, maybe others have different points. And I, I'd be super happy to hear that. That, that would help uh, edify me, but, um, you know, talking about this chain of custody is important and, and the industry is looking at that. And, and here we can see from the president of the American Herbal Products Association, an article written in their kind of leading trade industry magazine, that there is this kind of emerging new domestic sustainable supply of, of forest cultivated medicinal herbs and um, kind of holding up actually a lot of the activity that's happening right here in our backyard. And I'm, I'm fortunate enough to, to be part of that and to help lead that the Appalachian Beginning Forest Farming Coalition, uh, where we're looking at all opportunities around NTFPs and the traceability and the forest farming model. Uh, and actually the American Herbal Products Association uh, awarded the coalition the Herbal Ingenuity Award. So we are making some headway with, with the industry. And there are certification programs and you can see there's also branding. Mount Rose Herbs here was certified forest grown ginseng. Now that's domestic supply, domestic market. And so they have actually been able to brand and the price points are higher for that material and they're branding it as forest grown. And here you can see Emily Lockneed of Appalachian Sustainable Development. This is in Duffield, Virginia, processing some black cohosh roots that are forest farmed. And that is bringing a higher price point for that raw material. Uh, and that's, you know, it's not just happening in terms of like, you know, within the herbal products industry and, and awareness but you know, the media is picking up on it and Central Appalachia is really leading the way. So as an example, Appalachian Voice, but there's been, I mentioned the NPR uh, spot, but um, you know, there's been several others in the last few years, some radio spots and other types of articles that have come out that are showcasing what, what's underway here with respect to forest farming. And one of the prime examples of learning and evolving, uh, adapting is, is the Appalachian Harvest Herb Hub. The Appalachian Harvest Food Hub has been in existence for a long time. It's a sizable warehouse in Duffield where they aggregate product from a lot of small producers and then run those up and down the interstate corridors to Whole Foods and other types of grocery chains, get those into the marketplace. Well, what, what we noticed with some of our smaller forest farmers is that they were having a hard time, you know, managing time when it came to processing product to get it to spec to go into the supply chain in the way the industry wanted it. So they created the Appalachian Harvest Herb Hub, tied that into the food hub, and therein they have dryers and tumblers and they're tracking and monitoring, aggregating, and then also marketing some of those products and getting them into the supply chain. So here you can see inside the, the Appalachian Food and, and uh, Herb Hub, Appalachian Harvest Food and Herb Hub, but they have that processing equipment. And so the, the farmer can bring it there, not as processed as the industry might want it, uh, they can do the voucher specimens for them, a, a variety of different services. Uh, they take a small portion, but it, it, at the end of the day, it saves the producer so much time. And, um, you know, that's nested in that food handling facility. So they have all the approvals, you know, for uh, what's happening there, the protocols down. And like I said, it aggregates supply from forest farmers. And here's, here's what's interesting. You know, in 2017, and this was kind of like a nail-biting time, we're like, what's happening? 
One herbal products company purchased 50 pounds of one species at multiple, multiple times the price point they would have if it just came uh, through some standard buyers. In 2019, there's now multiple companies seeking thousands of pounds across multiple species. Um, and they're paying higher price points for that. And some of the companies are actually beginning to explore contracts, standing up planting stock supply programs, like the timber products industry did a long time ago with, with some of the you know, suppliers of the product they're dealing with now. They invested in that supply base um, and built out those contracts. And now they're reaping the wars because they're paying attention to the future today and, and how they're gonna be able to continue to supply. But the issue is, is that demand currently exceeds supply. So there's room for growth and that has some economic implications. And so I'm not here to, to say, oh, as a sugar birch person, you should, but consider, you know, I mean, going back to that image I showed you with that kind of open forest floor with the right conditions in terms of the soil, the duff looks beautiful. Uh, you know, maybe there's some stocking issues, but you got good canopy. So you have the shade and typically gonna be in the, the right type of aspect. and moisture conditions. I mean, there are some opportunities to, to take advantage of that, as Steve Gabriel has up in New York. So the coalition, uh, it's a, a multi-party stakeholder initiative. Uh, Virginia Tech leads it, but we have Penn State, who's also sponsoring some of this work, and NC State, but a lot of nonprofits out there providing educational programs, and that's really what we do. We have over a thousand members. It's free to join, AppalachianForestFarmers.org, get a newsletter, we have announcements from time to time. We'll let you know when we have trainings. Um, and we have a, a huge, oh, let me continue. So over the years, and we've been in existence since 2015 and, and continue to get funding, we've, you know, close to 20 forest farming training programs that we've offered. Over a thousand people have attended. We have uh, scores and scores of people that have planted out in the last two to five years, uh, you know, getting their hands on some planting stock, integrating that into their woodlands. Um, we do expos, so we bring together the industry with the producers um, and, and also the coalition members have those conversations, you know, get to know each other, those types of things. We have a, a nice YouTube channel with actually uh, quite a few uh, related to like reverse osmosis and other types of, you know, uh, sap syrup operation techniques. So we have videos along those lines, but also a whole host related to botanicals and mushrooms and so on. Uh, we have our newsletter and we have a Facebook group that's very active. So I encourage you to think about joining if you're interested. We also use some technology for siting. Uh, we have a, a forest farming siting tool that allows you to kind of query up to a thousand acres of forest land and get a heat map that shows you where some of the best habitat is for a select set of species. That'll help you rule out some other areas and kind of identify those that are prime spots. Maybe go take a look at them and dig a little bit deeper. Uh, hopefully maybe overlaced with your sugar bush. But we, we've got, you know, great farmers out there, you know, young, old, across the board, uh, Stesh and Jeremy Warren down in uh, North Carolina. Uh, we have two forest farmers that are participants uh, in Grayson County, Ruby Daniels in West Virginia. Uh, she's also a herbalist, so she, she's kind of vertically integrated. She grows and then she takes those products and uses them. John and Dana Beagle and uh, Floyd, they do a lot of mushroom production, but they've also set out some botanicals as well in their woodlands and they have livestock and so on. But I'd also encourage you, well, actually, if you're in West Virginia, um, you know, it's, it's a good thing. You can go onto the NRCS site and see that multi-story cropping is actually part of your NRCS standard. So there's potential cost share available with establishment. And we have received additional funding to continue uh, out to 2023 with the coalition. Uh, and U Mountain Center in West Virginia is now part of an organic grower school in North Carolina. Um, so here you can see the West Virginia Forest Farming Initiative, new partners, you know, so lots of activity going on around this and, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to be able to share that with you. In terms of next steps, we're gonna continue training, uh, expos and mentorship. Let me just check, check the time here. Um, so that's gonna continue. I mean, now we are in the midst of some challenging times with respect to gathering. Uh, we, we were able to have a meeting um, in West Virginia in May. We did that COVID safe in pods. Uh, it was all outdoors. It was great. Um, we had one in, in Ohio recently, a few weeks back. Um, that was also largely outdoors and managing. And we're, we're, we have one coming up this weekend. I'm leaving tomorrow, uh, as is Kate, for uh, a meeting in Duffield, Virginia. So we have a Friday night session and then all day Saturday. 
And then uh, Organic Grower School, they're hosting one online September 25 through 26. So what we were supposed to do last year, these were all supposed to happen last year, we're doing now and they're modified. But next year, we also have another round of, of training programs uh, that will come online. So uh, stay tuned. And then lastly, the American Forest Farming Council, uh, we're interested, or uh, we're actually not interested, we, we are aiming to uh, establish the council over time and stand down the coalition. Uh, coalitions shouldn't last forever. We've done a lot of work. I mean, it actually dates back to 2011, the partnership in many ways. Um, and so we're interested in standing down the coalition and transitioning into the American Forest Farming Council by end of 2023, early 2024. And we'd love to see, obviously, um, uh, SAPSER operators you know, uh, involved with that. And um, because what we want to do is we want to create a professional association. Now, I know you already have that in terms of you know, maple syrup producers and those types of things, but uh, this is something a little bit larger across America. And, Advocacy and awareness, I think, is, is a big part of it, and training education. So if you are integrating other crops in the system, you know, this, this council could be a place for um, networking and, and learning and sharing and, and leadership. Uh, and then point of harvest program is another thing we're working on where we're trying to work with the wild harvesters. Now, earlier I was talking about wild crafting. And, you know, we don't want to just say, okay, because you've been wild crafting and, you know, maybe your third generation, it doesn't matter anymore. Um, you know, what you're doing. We want to make that also part of the forest farming model because wild stewardship, as I showed you earlier, of these existing stands is part of it. And so how do we create a program that certifies the person uh, and their management activities on site, not just the land? So that's something we're, we're looking into. All right, in the last few minutes, uh, and I think I'm doing okay here, uh, silvopasture. And I only bring this up because, I mean, you can see this is... Uh, we have walnut trees uh, in this silver pasture. We also have honey locust, but I um, had an inter interesting conversation with some folks involved with sap syrup, and they were talking about the height of, of the tubing. And like here we see cattle, right? Cattle are you know, high profile, uh, tapping higher, uh, and then having cattle underneath. You know, so it was kind of an interesting conversation. I just throw that out there, food for thought. You know, here again, you see cattle, you're not going to be tapping your pine trees, uh, but that's what we're used to. However, uh, you know, back to the Steve Gabriel example, and that's actually his uh, sugar bush in the upper right there. Uh, you can see his flock of ducks. Now, what's cool about that is he does mushroom production, and this is where you can kind of get some of the optimization going on in the agroforestry system. He runs the ducks through the sugar bush, and uh, they browse on uh, the, the slugs, which oftentimes will get into your shiitake logs and damage your mushroom crop. Uh, and then they kind of enjoy that, you know, shaded canopied environment. And meanwhile, he's also managing. So the profile's not as high, um, but you know, you can see some other uh, bow silvo pastures that that people have installed running in that that kind of. I mean, obviously, they're the the chickens are you know they're jungle fowl. They they like the canopy. Um, but here we see kind of a classic example of some research that Virginia Tech is doing, looking at welfare of boiler chickens. Uh, under a broiler chickens underneath uh, canopy. And that's a black walnut tree right there. And so what they found in preliminary results is that there is a, a welfare advantages for that animal, which can translate to productivity advantages. Uh, but meanwhile, you're maintaining this canopy. And we haven't even touched on the ecosystem services that that can provide, um, you know, maintaining that canopy or establishing that canopy for silvopasture. And again, this is a black walnut. And lastly, riparian buffers, you know, multifunctional. Oh, right along the creek side, you want to stabilize that bank, but you know, extending out to enhance and improve water quality protection, fruit and nut trees. Well, why not also think about uh, you know, sap syrup operations in, in those areas? If you've got uh, wet feet trees that can produce uh, some sap that you can convert. And again, I noted some of the challenges earlier. But here we can see some work we did at Catawba, you know, just banging that up and, and getting that buffer going on there with some canopy. Uh, working in those spaces is our, our next objective. And then lastly, the community systems. And I'm just going to blow through these, but you can see this small little, what once was a parking lot. Look what they're doing in Portland. They're using that, creating that. And, and we do know through some national research that uh, SAP SERP operations have been integrated into those spaces to kind of enhance food access, food literacy, and those types of things, carry those practices back to other areas. 
to small cities and towns. Okay, well, um, thank you for the, the time, the opportunity, the attention. And I, I've gone dark here in my office, so I'm gonna turn the lights on <laughs> so you don't just see my face here. One second. Yeah, absolutely. And we have a raised hand from Ed. Ed, I'm gonna allow you to unmute yourself so you can probably unmute and ask a question if you have one. Oh, I'm sorry, I had to uh, hit the wrong button. Oh, okay, thanks, Ed. Um, here we go. I was wondering, I think you uh, posted a lot of great resources there. If I were interested, where do you think my first stop would be in terms of taking the next steps? Um, well, I, I think one of our, our biggest issues is uh, a planting stock. And um, so I mentioned the demand increasing dramatically. That's one thing that the coalition is, is very aware of. And we've heard from folks. Um, I think that, you know, taking advantage of, of the uh, coalition trainings and other information is very helpful. But there are, um, you know, and this is what one area where in terms of production, we haven't got, we don't have a lot of science that's been kind of brought to bear on uh, some of the production systems. Uh, however, there's kind of a deep um, traditional knowledge around how to cultivate some of these plants. So uh, oftentimes there are, you know, someone in the community or someone nearby who has um, dabbled or worked with these plants for a long time that is just a treasure trove of knowledge. So I would say the formal sources, but also the informal sources are good if you can find them. And a lot of times coming through the formal can connect you with the informal. Um, but we have extension publications and, and there are, you know, the Forest Service has put out uh, publications around these particular species that do have a lot of important insights regarding siting, regarding kind of behavior, re regarding kind of growth rates, those types of things. Um, Janine Davis uh, in her book uh, is, is a great resource. Farming the Woods, which Steve Gabriel co-authored with Ken Mudge, is also a great resource. Um, so I don't, I might actually get here. So this one is Janine Davis and Scott Person. Janine is at North Carolina State um, and she's a horticulturist, but this is you know, ginseng, golden seal and other woodland medicinals. And it's, it's kind of like the Bible um, in that regard. And also there is this book, Farming the Woods by Ken Mudge and Steve Gabriel. And this has just a, a whole bunch of beautiful pictures and kind of deep case stories, case studies and uh, other types of information that can be useful regarding, you know, site management, selection, identification, those types of things. So, um, you know, you, we, we were trying to build up that network so it's a little bit more available and accessible. And that also includes the planting stock. So we, we do know folks that can provide that as well. So, and I, I, I appreciate, was that, that was it? Your comment, Kate, right about sycamores and red maples. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that was the one thing that, like, you know, and I don't. Again, I'm not. I don't know as much as uh, folks on this this uh, meeting necessarily when it comes to that. But uh, you know, I read about like red maple kind of breaking bud earlier, and we do know that. But then, what is the effect? Where you get like it's called a green sap or something, where it's a little bit more floral or or the, the, fl the flavor palette kind of gets off a touch. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you get buddy sap because the metabolism process in the tree actually shifts a little bit. And it. Uh, some people say it tastes sort of Tootsie Rolly. Uh, oh, wow, yeah. Interesting, but yeah. it does uh, indicate end of season. So a lot of times people try to isolate their reds if they can on specific lines and they'll just cut those lines at the end of the season. Or some people will actually run around and untap reds and let their sugars run a little bit longer. Um, you have another. About, oh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to say um, we have a question from Chelsea that says, How do you keep poachers out of your forest herbs? Well, um, fencing, cameras, in some cases, you, it's you, you know, it's difficult. Um, and that, that is a challenge. Uh, I would say again, just to emphasize that uh, a lot of those poachers are out there with ginseng dollar signs in their eyes. And so ginseng, you know, it is, um, 
it has that reputation and, and rightly so because it does happen. And I mean, there, there are tragic cases of actually people shooting poachers and that type of thing. So um, now some strategies that are used is because they're perennial. Some folks will go in and weed whack them as you're approaching the ginseng season. So when folks are thinking about, okay, it's getting late August, September, I'm gonna go, you know, maybe before the season, go and try and find some, whatever the case may be, because sales are picking up, um, you know, folks will, will whack it away. Now, I don't, you know, what are the long-term implications of that? Mostly, you know, carbohydrates and things have already been produced. It's kind of senescing to some extent at that point. Um, you know, also as much of a threat as, as humans are, the voles are just as bad, if not worse. Um, you know, they, they'll get at your ginseng and, and uh, golden seal and they girdle those, those uh, plants and, and destroy your roots. And so that's also a challenge. And, uh, you know, I was just not long ago in Eastern Kentucky meeting with a pretty prolific and, you know, well-respected ginseng and golden seal grower. And he has, he's got some devices out there that send frequencies that are not, you know, <laughs> the, the voles and voles and, they don't like so much of field mice. So kind of keeping them away in that regard. And, and some others put cats out, but then, you know, you kind of get into the, the wild bird issue, like the cats out there just killing the birds and they're also, you know, killing the, the mice. Well, that's great, but the trade-off is you got the birds dying. Um, and cameras, um, you know, that's, that's another thing. And, you know, we do have a pickup in some law enforcement too. Uh, now, unfortunately, a lot of times it's a destructive harvest that happens. Um, but Indiana just this season has busted quite a few folks uh, that have been kind of illegally harvesting ginseng, either out of season or getting on some property they shouldn't. Um, and you know they're they're taking that, but by that time the, the roots already gone. And I'm not sure what the fate of it is in terms of the market, but it is a challenge. There's no doubt. That was a thorough answer. I. I'd there uh, has been a couple people in West Virginia who hypothesize if hanging enough maple tubing around patches of ginseng will make them hard enough to get to, but. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, so there's an optimization of, of equipment <laughs> of like using man-made equipment to, uh, you know, create something that uh, is protected uh, from, we're also embedded in ecosystems, by the way. So, uh, you know, humans are a threat, just like voles. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any other questions? Um, that was a great talk, John. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> and I'll, I'll see you on Saturday, but. Yeah, sorry I went dark there. You know, it was nice and light <laughs> and everything. I was like, this, this light is too bright and then turned it off and yeah. Yeah, the, the good old floating head effect. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, thanks for the time folks. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity and uh, Again, Appalachian uh, ForestFarmers.org if you're interested and, and keep your eyes peeled for additional trainings. And mm -hmm. you know, we've, we've got good relationships with uh, Future Generations University. So yes, yeah, see you on uh, see this weekend, Kate, and, then, and again, uh, later on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just launched a poll that asks if you need CFE credits. I forgot to mention this at the start, but today it does hold 1.5 continuing forestry education credits um, from SAF. Um, if anybody needs them, please feel free to respond. Um, I guess further announcements is next month on October. Oh my goodness, let me pull up my calendar. September's flying by. October uh, 28th, we will have Mike, Dr. Mike Recklin uh, with Future Generations talking about this year's walnut research um, that we have conducted. Uh, we also have some new sycamore research coming out, so hopefully we'll have a little bit more information on other tree species that could be involved in a syrup production here soon. Awesome. Um, and then one more poll for y'all. It's just a quick exit poll. Um, let us know what you think, if this webinar was helpful. Um, we're always up for suggestions and feel free to reach out at syrup at future.edu, even if it is about forest farming. Uh, we are happy to direct you to the right resources um, as we can. So please feel free to reach out if anybody has any questions about tonight's talk or any other 
topics you would all like to see covered? Yeah. Well, thanks, everybody. I hope everyone has a great night and a great weekend. Enjoy the last of uh, late summer. See you, Kate. Mm -hmm. See you Saturday. Yep.